occupy the stage for too long, so he will come up and uh, you know he will drive the speaker off the stage <laughs> uh, in his cute hat. You know we all seen it yesterday, but I hope this doesn't happen. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome the first speaker. Please, stage uh, is yours. Go. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm the presentator, and uh, this is the idea of our professor, uh, Shigeo Tsuji, and I'm presenting, Masahito Gotaishi is presenting for and on behalf of him. And this is the abstract we skip, and our idea is making use of not the finite field, but uh, residual ring. It is uh, not, not prime number, uh, product of small, uh, uh, small prime numbers. So uh, then we create, hmm? then we create uh, set of uh, polynomials in this way. Uh, each of uh, the uh, secret key uh, polynomials consists this way. Uh, they are the devices of the modular. And this, in this way. Uh, the polynomials are made this way to create uh, linear equations to eliminate uh, the quadratic polynomials. In this way, when we solve these poly uh, equations, we get the value of the uh, variables, each variables, and uh, we can uh, so, uh, we can decrypt uh, the multi, -quadra uh, multi quadratic polynomial polynomial equation by solving linear equation. The, uh, therefore, it's expected to be very quick, and uh, the security is expect uh, relies on uh, the brute force attack on trying every device of the modular. Uh, this is an example of trying. Uh, the uh, devices. Uh, then uh, this is a to uh, to uh, practical example, uh, making use of uh, 196 prime numbers, uh, pro product of 196 prime numbers, is made the modulum. Uh, it would be very difficult uh, to, uh, to find the right divisor of the uh, 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 large n. Therefore, uh, we've uh, checked uh, it's, uh, cent uh, yes, this is a central map. Yeah, how, how the central map should be co uh, consisted, and uh, this is the security of uh, uh, algebraic against algebraic attack. These very close to the purely random system. Therefore, we expect that it is quite uh, secure. Uh, thank you very much. And Thank you. Uh, yes, the rest is uh, rather out of the whole, out of the uh, out of the scope of the PQC, but uh, it is expected uh, to have lots of uh, fields uh, to be applied. Okay. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Yoichi Hirose. Uh, today, I will talk about Mayo zero algorithm uh, for nearest neighbor problem of FQ and its application to information decoding. Uh, information set decoding is an algorithm for decoding random linear codes, and it is also a generic attack on code based crypto systems. And for parity check matrix H and vector X, uh, it consists of two steps. Uh, the first one is permutation step. And this step uh, first randomly permute the columns of H and transform the permuted H with Gaussian elimination. And uh, such a linear co uh, this algorithm such a linear combination of P columns of Q whose Hamming distance to uh, S tilde is W minus P, and W is the, the Hamming rate of the error vector E. And May and Ozerov designed the nearest neighbor algorithm to be used for the search step. 
and the algorithm, algorithm is originally described in GF2. So uh, we generalize uh, the algorithm o o over F FQ, uh, over any finite field. And then we apply, may, uh, we apply the extended algorithm to the Stern information set decoding algorithm. And we observe that uh, the Stern algorithm with a mayor is more efficient than the, the original Stern only if over GF2. And this is the definition of the nearest neighbor problem of IFQ. And this has three parameters, m, uh, gamma, and lambda. Uh, m, m is an integer, and the m represents the length of the vectors. And gamma and, la gamma and lambda, uh, lambda specifies the number of vectors, a given number of vectors. And the input is the uh, pair of sets of vectors, u and v. Uh, and lambda specifies the number of the vectors. And the output is also a, a pair of vectors, uh, including the input pairs, uh, input pair, uh, which have the target vector u star and v star, which are close to each other. And the, the distance is specified by this uh, parameter gamma. And this is an overview of the mayo zero algorithm of IFQ. And this algorithm, uh, repeats these two steps, uh, uh, m to the order of q to the three times. So it is still polynomial in the length of the vectors if q is a constant, but uh, it is huge in general. And the first one, uh, and in the first step is the randomize and filter step. And this step uh, randomize each vector by permuting the coordinates of the vectors and adding a randomly selected balance vector, balance vector vector, and only the balance vectors are picked up. And in the second step, uh, create a pair of lists by filtering. Uh, this step is repeated over repeated q to the order of m times. So uh, this step is exponential. And in this step, uh, first, in this step, uh, the the vectors are picked up by observing a pair of coordinates uh, chosen uniformly at random uh, in this way. And, and if the target vectors are picked up, then the, the algorithm is successful. And the intuitive idea is since uh, the target vectors are close to each other, so for some parts of the coordinates, uh, if one of the vector has a bias on the selected uh, coordinates, then the other has also the same similar bias. And actually, uh, this, uh, the algorithm is uh, applied uh, step, uh, block by block. So the vectors, given vectors, are divided into t blocks. And the second step on the previous slide is applied recursively. So the process of the computation can be represented by a tree structure. So uh, the first step, uh, the first block, the, the algorithm applied to the first block. Okay. Okay, and uh, this is the time complexity, uh, and we om omit the detail, but uh, this analysis is uh, coincides with the uh, anal original analysis by me and those of over F2. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, so this is John work with uh, Tony, who's going to talk uh, the next uh, talk in Buyin. And I'm the guy with a non-Chinese name here. <laughs> uh, so we uh, took some, some time and efforts to break some of the Fokuga MQ challenges. So we are giving a system of random equations, quadratic equations. And uh, the goal is to find some solution for those um, equations. And uh, they give um, six different types uh, of, of systems here, um, varying in, in particular in the field from GF2 to GF2 to the 8, and also in, in the ratio between number of um, equations and variables. And we had uh, some code sitting around which allowed us to, to attack this type 1, type 3, and type 4 systems. And uh, we are not using any kind of, of um, explicit uh, Kripal basis solvers, so we're doing it in a more direct way. Um, so the, the GF31 case we, we solved with using XL, so XL stands for externalization. 
So you just take your original quadratic system and then you multiply it by a bunch of uh, monomials um, up to a certain degree. Then you treat all the monomials as uh, individual vari variables. You get a big linear system, which is very sparse. And then you solve this linear system and you hope that the solution also has a solution for your original uh, multivariate system. So we're using, for this uh, sparse system solving, we're using a uh, Coppersmith uh, block readable algorithm or a variant of this. And here um, are the two systems we could solve, um, both within a month and a month and a half. So the first step then would be to compute uh, a series of, of squares of this sparse matrix and uh, some, some trace of, of uh, these uh, squares. And the second step, you do some bulk and messy um, computation to get a minimal polynomial. And then you usually would apply this again to the big sparse matrix to get a solution for the linear system. But we don't care about most of those uh, variables. We only want to have the original variables. So Tony had a very nice idea how to just compute the trace in a way that we can just apply this minimal polynomial to the trace, which is much, much cheaper because it's much, much smaller uh, matrices. And then the last step to actually compute the solutions only for the original variables is very fast and doesn't really matter anymore. So we could kind of half uh, the runtime of this algorithm. Um, then for the other cases, for the GF2 cases, uh, we're using a gray code enumeration. That means we kind of do a brute force search in a smart way. We just switch uh, single variables and update uh, the evaluation of the last time just corresponding to the change of the currently changed variable. Um, this just um, leads to, to a few um, bit operations and a small amount of memory for deriv derivatives. And we're using FPGAs to solve this. We have um, quite a bunch of FPGAs sitting in Taiwan. And we can put uh, quite a, lots of parallelism on each of those FPGAs. Um, so actually, we can solve, uh, up to now, systems with up to uh, 66 uh, variables. Um, for the type 1 case, within a week. So the worst case would have been like something like a month. We could do it, with, luckily, within a week. And also, we could solve those uh, type 4 systems up to the similar degree to 66 variables. And now you can imagine we are just a small research facility. We don't have much money and much, much resources. If we would have uh, 1,000 times more resources than us, then you could solve systems up to 67 variables in the same time. If you're willing to spend a bit more time, you get easily up to 2 to the 80 in terms of um, computational power. So if your system is based on GF2 multivariates, then 80-bit security is a very bad way to go. OK, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks to Tanya and, and Ingo. So I guess I don't have to give too much about uh, motivation of this work. So here you see uh, Smokey, and you should read it as um, using QC and DBC code. Constantine, well, Constantine is a common common word, but if you don't really know, uh, it means that the software itself is uh, timing attack resist resistance. And QuickBit is just the name of the software. And if you want to know, um, stand for QC and DPC plus B slicing. Here are some performance uh, results. So all the information that I want to give here is just that. So uh, quick bit, it's uh, faster than previous uh, constant time results. And in many cases, it's even faster than previous uh, non-constant time results. And here, uh, please note that it's for th this table is for 80-bit proof content security. And well, if you want to know, you can ask why. Uh, I only show 80-bit security. Okay. Uh, regarding techniques, so um, the decoding in each decoding iteration there are two steps. The first step is uh, synchron computation. You can view it as a um, matrix operation like this. But uh, it will be nicer if you can view it as a polynomial uh, like this, uh, A, B plus uh, C, D. And uh, QuickBit just uh, implement this polynomial modification using PCO monkey DQ, or in case that uh, there's no PCO monkey DQ, I use uh, barrel shifter. And the second step is uh, counting numbers on this satisfied parity checks 
can uh, again uh, view it as metric operation, but it would be nicer if you view it as uh, polynomial modifications like uh, A, B, and C, D. And the technique I use is uh, bear shifter plus bit slicing. Okay. And uh, everything will be put on the, this link. And well, the slice is already there. And I guess sometime today I'll put uh, the current draft of the, the paper also on it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. This is about the HEMO scheme and the contest. Uh, my name is Oscar, and uh, Ronald and Ludo are my colleagues. Um, so years ago, uh, we thought that uh, we would like to have a scheme with nice features, so energy efficiency, uh, small messages, and real time uh, <coughs> fits uh, device life cycle, so we were thinking about IoT, uh, simple operation, and uh, very uh, secure. So we took a different approach. We were uh, thinking about a uh, Keep distribution scheme that we would like to make uh, efficient and collision resistant. So keep distribution scheme means that we have a TTP and uh, you can roll entities uh, based on the identities. And uh, basically, the, in the second step, the device gets a function that is depending on the identity or credentials. And uh, once you have enrolled the identities, then you can do very nice things. So for instance, A can send a message to B, and that message is uh, encrypted, authenticated. And B can even uh, verify credentials, so things that you would do with the data signatures. And messages are very short. Um, so we have been working on this for a number of years. Last year, we announced the uh, HEMO challenge during the uh, NIST workshop on uh, post-quantum. Uh, that's online still. Um, that's uh, to uh, tell you about the uh, results. Uh, the challenges were downloaded in around 30 times. So maybe some people uh, didn't do anything, some other people did. Um, we had uh, three different challenges. We had for the underlying problems, the high and MMO, and for HEMO. Uh, for high and MMO, what happened was solid, only uh, small instances of the uh, problems were solved. For the HEMO challenge, uh, the goal was to uh, guess the symmetric key between a, a pair of non-compromised devices. And many of the challenges were solved, except the uh, one with the uh, highest security parameter, alpha. So uh, who and how? Uh, this was uh, Monsoon Lee, uh, first in Korea, later in the middle of the year he moved to Luxembourg, so closer uh, to Eindhoven, so that was very nice. And basically he developed to a method based on orthogonal analysis um, that allows uh, finding an approximate solution to the MMO problem. So that doesn't solve the MMO challenges, but not solving uh, many of the uh, HEMO challenges. So then uh, my uh, colleagues and uh, myself, we were thinking uh, uh, how uh, parameters will be updated. And uh, for those who know about HEMO, uh, what we did was uh, we took uh, N independent of uh, security parameter alpha, so before it was dependent of it. So that uh, allows for a much more efficient uh, implementation of HEMO uh, and setting up the security parameter much higher. So at some point of time uh, in January, we invited uh, Monsoon, that is now it's, uh, very close to Eindhoven, and said, oh, that's uh, very nice. And then we started working together uh, also on a paper. Uh, that now it's uh, online, and then you can find it here. So it's uh, co-authored uh, by uh, Ronald, Ludo, and uh, Jose Luis in Eindhoven, Monsoon Lee in uh, Luxembourg, and uh, Domingo and Jaime in uh, Spain, and uh, Berry also in Eindhoven. And here where you will find uh, security parameters and also an uh, overview of all the uh, attacks. So I would be happy to uh, get further feedback about the scheme. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. We are uh, Shishinuk Chueng Satyansop and Christine van Vreendaal. And we're going to tell you something about Entrue Prime, uh, specifically the security and performance analysis. And this is joint work with Daniel Bernstein and Tanya Lam. So, what is Entrue Prime? Like with Entrue, the public key is some small polynomial divided by some other small polynomial and then reduced modulo Q and modulo some. Uh, polynomial and in n through this polynomial is x to the power n minus 1 for some integer n uh, modulus q is 2 to the power d and 
uh, all these choices make uh, implementation very fast, but it also causes um, the polynomial to factor mod Q, and it has multiple uh, proper subfields. So we propose n through prime, which takes a slightly different polynomial, namely x to the power p minus x minus 1 for p prime. And we also choose the modulus q prime, and we choose it such that the polynomial x to the power p minus x minus 1 is actually irreducible mod q, so it has no factors. And also there's only one proper subfield. Now there currently aren't any known attacks against the subfields of n through, but we thought why not just be safe and not have a lot of subfields. So n through prime has another two advantages. Uh, first advantage, every m is encryptable, so choosing the wrong m that has a very low, uh, very sparse representation uh, isn't attackable. And also we choose q so large that there is no probability of decryption failures. So we investigated uh, pro possible parameter sets against the strongest known attack, namely the hybrid attack combining BKC and meet in the middle attack, and also against lattice sieving, and we found these parameters, so P881, Q7673, uh, T, which is the sparsity of the message of 159, and this leads to a key si size of about 11,000 bits, and the security of 2 to the power 257. The question that remains is, is it still fast? And she should will say something about that. So we analyzed the main time, the time consuming operation, which, which is polynomial multiplications. And how can we multiply um, 800 to 900 coefficients of polynomials. So we analyze different algorithms of how to do a multiplication, which are to refine Karazuba and arbitrary degree variance of Karazuba. And with, so we analyze all of these combinations, like how to decompose those nine, uh, 800, almost 900 coefficients. How can we decompose those in using like different pieces like tomb three, four, five, six, seven, or using Krasuba or using what kind of polynomials multiplication should we use? And we with the current analysis we found that it is the best to decompose eight ninety six using five levels of refined Krasuba. And so this will take us up to 128, and then we do tomb seven, and we evaluate at zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, plus minus four, plus minus five, and six, and at infinity. And this is the b the current best way. And um, we also, we the implementation is is in process, and we are using Haswell with vectorization. And uh, and as well can perform like eight multiplication per cycle, and on this table on the first line is a, a theoretical count. We we count how many operations that we have to perform, and then the second line is a expected number of cycles. So, as you can see, even though we prevent more future possible attacks, but the performance is not that bad. So we do expect quite fast program. Thank you. Hello, I, I've got 47 slides, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, <laughs> So uh, this is actually a, a mainly Jeff's idea, and uh, I mean collaboration with uh, uh, Jill, Joe, John, and William. And my, my name is Chen Fei. So it's based on a uh, key observation of Jeff's, and that is any two finite field of same order are isomorphic. The question would be how to use it, and I'm not trying to talk about how to use it. 
here. I'm trying to talk about um, what, what aspect this isomorphic brings us. So what is the uh, finite field isomorphism? So we know that for any irreducible polynomial mod Q, uh, it defines a uh, copy of a uh, finite field of FQ to the power n. So here I've got two copies here, uh, the, left, uh, the left one, the red one, and sorry, the left one is defined by the X polynomial, we call it X space, and the, the right side is defined as green polynomial, we call, it, we call it white space, and there is a uh, circuit mapping from sending element from X space to the white space to the white space. Um, you can, you, it mean, it's quite clear that the constant terms are always mapped to the constant terms, but we, the hope is that any random element in the X space, <coughs> non-constant element, can be mapped to a, another random element in the Y space. So more visually, what you can see is like this. So red, um, red blocks are the smaller, smaller, smaller elements in the finite field, so it's close to zero. And the green ones are close to the, um, five to the power five. And the, the, the top left gives you 25 different elements in the X space, and the, the top right gives you another 25 elements in the Y space. They are, they are one on one mapping. But what you can see is that it gives you, it, you have some sort of a structure in this mapping, but uh, what, what is more important is that two closed vectors in the X space map to a, uh, two vectors in the Y space that doesn't have any specific uh, length, which in another word, Short vectors in the X space are mapped to a random vector, ran, are mapped to a vector of random length in the Y space. And so we are, we are talking about vectors, now we can talk about lattice. If, I mean, we, in lattice-based crypto, we are always talking about the shortest, uh, unique shortest vector problem. What if we can, we can somehow hide this unique shortest vector? So we, we map a uh, lattice with unique short, shortest vector, such as N2 lattice, to a uh, Y space lattice where the uh, unique shortest vector no, no longer exists. That's, uh, um, that's one of the aspects that this isomorphism brings us. Another one is that it's homomorphic. We all like homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. This actually gives you a, a quite nice homomorphic encryption by itself. So if we have two, e two elements, Ax and Bx in the X space, we map it to the Y space, and the, the addition of the two X space elements will be, will be mapped to the addition of the uh, elements in the to Y space, uh, oh, sorry, will be mapped to the elements of the addition of the AY and BY in the Y space. So combining this isomorphism and uh, the, um, the homomorphic en encryption, we can obtain a uh, signature scheme. How do we do it? We, we, we generate a, uh, a signature in the X space and we publish the, the data of this signature in the Y space. This, um, and then the, the X space becomes a uh, signing signing space, the Y space become the, uh, the verification space. The, the, the verifier just verify the everything in the Y space and he doesn't know anything about X space. The good point about this part is that the, there's no unique shortest vector in the, in the Y space lattice. So the c conventional attack on the lattice, on the entry lattice will not work anymore. And the last slide, that this, is the last, this is actually the last slide I have. So the, uh, it's about the hard, hardness of the isomorphism that we are trying to analyze and also the lattice strength. So the, the hardness, the, the problem that we're trying to identify is that given a, given a uh, white space element, will we be able to find the corresponding X, X space element given there are constra some constraints on the X space element such that the X space element has some, uh, some non-bound. And the lattice strength that we're talking about here is that um, the X, let's say we have a X space lattice with unique short vector, with unique shortest vectors, then what kind of property that we can prove in the Y space that this um, Y space lattice doesn't have? Um, that is actually the end of the slides and I made it 48, seven, uh, 47 slides, 46 slides. <laughs> the rest are the details if you, are, if you want to read. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ahmed Rosebury. I'm here to present uh, an introduction to our framework for evaluating software and hardware implementations of quantum algorithms on Zinc system on a chip. So let's start with some motivation. Um, as you all know, the multiple families of post-quantum crypto systems 
have uh, different performance in software and hardware at the same security level. So early benchmarking can provide feedback for cryptographers and crypt analysts about um, the most promising algorithms and parameter sets. Uh, hardware and embedded software play a major role in the, in the future of Internet of Things. And also the complex post-quantum schemes uh, provide uh, interesting opportunities for hardware and software co-design. So for those who aren't familiar, it, um, the Zinc system on a chip looks like this diagram here. Basically, it is a hard processor integrated with an FPGA on the same die. And uh, the, the block diagram in general is shown on the left here. The processing system is made up of a dual core ARM processor uh, that interfaces with the FPGA through an AXI interface uh, provided by ARM. And basically, there are two modes of operation, the bare metal mode and the Linux mode. The difference with uh, Linux is the operating system running on top of the CPU. And here's a quick overview of the differences. We can see that uh, bare metal provides full uh, control and execution. I mean, I'm sorry, full control over the execution of software with a very small overhead uh, at the cost of a limited functionality but this is suitable for uh, some repetitive, straightforward tasks. On the other hand, uh, Linux provides um, a good separation between software and hardware, uh, and access to multiple software libraries such as OpenSSL. It's user-friendly, it's an open source platform that's uh, been constantly tested, and uh, it's updated. There's also a wide range of applications, uh, such as supercomputers, um, and uh, however, there is a cost of possible overhead. So, so we have currently investigated these two schemes here, code-based uh, QC MDPC and a lattice-based Bliss scheme. QC MDPC was implemented with 80 bits of security due to area implementations and uh, Bliss with 192 bits of security. These were uh, based upon work from uh, Tim Ganesu's group in uh, Bochum, Germany. It's provided online as open source code. So here's an overview of our framework. Basically, you have the encryption and decryption modules surrounded by uh, standard DMA modules. Okay, so the encryption and decryption cores are what I was referring to on the previous slide. And we um, control the uh, initiation of encryption and decryption through software, um, memory mapped registers, which, are, which is shown right here. And and through this interface, we can stream in the plain text and ciphertext with the keys into the encryption or decryption and stream out the ciphertext or plain text. So this allows us a good degree of flexibility. Um, so quickly, the software drivers are a bit different for each system. With the bare metal implementations, we're using drivers that are automatically generated by Xilinx tools. Whereas for Linux, we had to create our own kernel level driver that uh, was based upon crypto dev. And um, this allows to read and write from a uh, character device called dev slash crypto. We have renamed it to PQ crypto dev. And uh, this allows us to communicate with the hardware to initiate encryption decryption, as I mentioned, uh, through uh, middleware applications running in the user space. So we plan to take uh, measurements that are shown here for public key, private key operations, end-to-end uh, -end execution time, maximum clock frequency operations per second, key generation in software, and the key transfer time from software to hardware. Uh, we're operating at a 100 megahertz clock for the uh, measurements that we've taken. So here's an example of our results for QC MDPC. As you can see, there is some overhead for Linux and uh, about 350% for transferring the keys, uh, and also about, at most, less than 10% for encryption or decryption end-to-end. -end. So the platform we used was a Z-board. Uh, it's a general purpose development board costing less than $500, not including academic discounts. Um, so we still have measurements remaining, which we hope to report in upcoming FPGA conferences and ePrint. So that concludes my talk. Thank you. Okay, so uh, say you want to perform a preview attack on
Ashbinder. Uh, what kind of computer should you build? Should you build a classical computer or a quantum computer, assuming both of those options are available to you? This is something that a bunch of us at IQC have been thinking about, uh, and so I want to tell you about our process in which we're fine tuning it. Um, so uh, if we're not exploiting structural weaknesses in the hash functions, then we basically have two options, right? There's the classical brute force race, if we parallelize it, and then there's uh, Grover's trick. And if you're familiar with Grover, it looks something like this. We got a, ha uh, a function, k bits to k bits, and we try and find some uh, particular uh, out uh, pre-image of some particular output. And Grover says, And uh, Grover says that this is going to take you two to the, uh, sorry, square root of two to the k queries to some function. Uh, F, which takes a k bit input and tells you whether or not h of x is equal to y, right? Uh, and classically, you're going to do something like two to the k queries, okay? But queries are not really a good thing to compare. Uh, classical queries versus quantum queries are not really um, the same thing. Quantum queries might be uh, very expensive if you try to, you know, actually instantiate your oracle. So let's look at um, Grover's search in particular. Let's look at, uh, try to estimate the cost of Grover's algorithm. So we write down a circuit. It's got some uh, setup uh, here, and then you just do the same Grover iteration, uh, square root of two to the k times. Look inside that Grover iteration. It's got these two components. Uh, one of them, the diffusion operator, that's Grover's brilliant idea. The other one is the oracle. So you need to cost both of these uh, components. Uh, the oracle needs to be instantiated, so we write down some reversible circuit uh, that implements it. And if you look inside that, you'll see some familiar elements. There's some uh, reversible implementation of your hash function that you call twice, once to compute and once to uncompute your input, and you have some comparison circuit too. So we cost all of these things, uh, and that's you know um, what we do at the reversible layer. Now we want to go one la layer deeper. We want to look at the logical layer, the uh, operations you can actually do on your quantum computer. So we take that uh, high-level description of the algorithm and we compile it down to a universal gate set, uh, Clifford plus T in our case. There are other options, but that's a common one. And then we optimize the circuit. You want to minimize the T count because the T gates are extremely expensive. Uh, so our first contribution is T count optimized reversible implementations for the SHA-2 and SHA-3 families of functions. Uh, this is uh, very similar to the work we saw on Wednesday from Brandon on uh, AES. Uh, so you can see the, the numbers here, we've broken it up by uh, the number of gates, the depth, and the number of qubits, uh, and we split it between T gates and Clifford gates uh, because, again, the Ts are, are very expensive. Now, still, this doesn't give us a way to compare Grover search against classical search because these are not classical operations, and it doesn't really make sense to say, uh, you know, compare Clifford's to NAND's or something like that. Um, so we need to look specifically at a particular architecture to get a better estimate for the cost. Uh, and we look around and we see, if you look at um, what people say when they actually are interested in building quantum computers, they you find people saying things like, without significant future effort, the classical processing will almost certainly limit the speed of any quantum computer, particularly one with intrinsically fast quantum gates. So we thought, well, what is this classical processing that's going on? Uh, and maybe we can just look at the cost of that classical processing. So instead of having this uh, query model, you think of, uh, having a large classical computer that is controlling a quantum computer as kind of a peripheral, and you just look at um, the amount of effort you're going to do on that classical computer. Okay, so our second contribution is a cost model that we, in which we can compare things like Grover search uh, against classical brute force search, and it looks something like this. We assume we're using surface code quantum computing. Um, we estimate the additional resources that we need uh, at the fault tolerance layer. So in particular, uh, the most expensive one is magic state distillation factories for all the T, T gates that we need to apply. Then we cost only the classical resources. And we make a few assumptions here, like that um, essentially each logical qubit requires its own parallel classical processor, and that each surface code cycle, this is kind of the operations that you do on a, a 200 nanosecond to one microsecond scale on your classical computers. Each one of those is about the same cost classically as an application of your hash function. And so then you just compute your cost as surface code cycles times logical qubits, and you get uh, units of hash function applications. So now we can compare something like queries to the hash function for your uh, classical control uh, computer that's running your quantum computer versus queries to the hash function just on a regular classical computer. And uh, since this is just a five-minute talk, I'm not giving you the actual numbers. You'll have to wait for our, uh, our paper for that. Uh, thanks.
Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, the organizer and all the audience. Well, I know that the only reason keep you still sit here is not my presentation, but the, our next guys, next one. All right, I try my best to finish this in time. Here is uh, all the overview of PQC workshops and projects standardization concerning China and uh, all the just represent our personal opinions. Take fully responsibility for that. Uh, here is uh, what I'm trying to talk first is the national strategy about uh, related to the PQC and uh, what kind of project and uh, workshops benefit from that and also how, how they deeply impact to our existing uh, standard systems uh, and also what is the potential market for the future um, PQC. Well, exactly 20 years ago, the Chinese government issued the so-called the long, medium and the long-term program for the science and technology development. So in which we have uh, three layers relate to the the, what I'm talking about today. First is the key domain and uh, primary direction, which will um, focus on the cyber uh, trust world system and new encryption schemes. And second is the fundamental research, which is the basic mathematical problems related to the quantum related relate questions. And the third one is a so-called crucial uh, science project which we focus on the anything related to the quantum information. So that's how we organized. Uh, what is the national strategy related to the PQC? Now let's see what kind of project uh, we can benefit from the strategies. We basically, we have uh, three organizations to deal with the project. First one is the Ministry of Science and Technology will issue the, the project code name is 973. And another one is the National Natural Science Foundation. So provide the, the, the more fund. And also we have a state office of the commercial uh, cryptography will provide some open fund for this research. Um, for the Ministry of the Science and Technology, which is the biggest one, we have the 973 project study on key mathematical problems raised from the modern encryption, uh, cryptography and their applications. It's uh, over $10 million. And also, uh, we have another at least 10 quantum-related research projects, uh, 973, 973 projects. All of them relate to the quantum device, uh, quantum control, quantum circuits, because we need somehow the silver bullet to see how, how safe, how secure the, the modern encryption system is. Uh, for the national science, we have uh, at least, as I know, two key programs, which is over a million dollars, and uh, study on the lattice space and the multivariant and also other families of the PQC. Um, about the workshops, many workshops hold in China recent years. And here is uh, two main resources you can find out. One is Chinese cryptography report and another is report on advanced in cryptography. All of them talk about something related to the PQC stuff. And here is uh, distribution of the PQC workforce and the workload over 20 institutes, more than 500 researchers, include the PhD students involved, and uh, over 10 key projects are processing. Uh, okay, so um, we'll try to finish first. Uh, how deeply impact, impact to our existing standard systems well, currently we have uh, around 60% self-made national standard and 16 adopting international standards. Sorry, Matt, I talk about the 47, I remember that. It's a wrong number. It's a 16 around. So what I'm trying to say, if we get involved more international standards, then we will adopt, adopt more international standards. That's, that's what I'm about, okay? And, uh, okay, sorry. 
Uh, here is uh, how many standard groups we should deal with if we want uh, port of the PQC uh, standardized. That is uh, from working group one to working group seven in China, especially start from working group three. Um, also, uh, all the PQC family we wish to embed it to the future business model uh, include cloud computing, Internet of Things, etc. because that's all we're concerned. Okay, last is the future potential market. Alibaba, you can check out, uh, he created a new business model in one day online shopping. In 2014, around uh, 5 billion RMB involved in the one day, in one day. And uh, 2015, that's 19 billion dollars RMB in one day. So we will see what happened this year, uh, online shopping. And uh, this is uh, Tricent. In 1914, we only have uh, 5 million people involved. Now, this year, we have uh, 500 million people involved because China is <laughs> number one. Uh, population in the world, so you can see how many online people involved in this stuff. How, here is the circulation of the digital circulates. Um, in 2010, we only issued uh, around 15, uh, 15 million tickets. And till now, uh, 2014, because um, we still calculate the final number for 2015. So, uh, 2014, is raised to almost um, uh, 282 million tickets issued. So you can, you can imagine how big the potential market for PQC in the future. So basically, that's what I'm talking about as the overview. Thank you.